Okay. Okay, the uh, next speaker is William Farrell. Uh, a possible limit on roving speed for resource prospector. All right, so um, this is really a modeling study, and in fact, it's actually a, a little mini engineering study that was really started out to be in support of Resource Prospector. Uh, and it's the idea of how much can a, a rover wheel charge as it goes into one of these PSRs. So we, so, uh, we have, uh, the title here is a little different than what we uh, originally had <coughs> due to the changes in the, uh, what's happened with Resource Prospector, but what we say here in general applies to any rover, like what Tony just described, uh, heading into the PSRs. Now, uh, again, Resource Prospector mission at high latitudes, the rovers at high latitudes, entering into uh, small to moderate sized PSRs, craters, to examine the local hydration with depth and hydroxylation heterogeneity. And when I started working with Tony on this, they were actually started, just starting to set up some simulation, uh, simulation studies uh, going through uh, uh, traverse scenarios. And they were looking at various environmental conditions, including uh, lighting, getting surface reflectance modeling, uh, rock, uh, cratering and rock distributions, and even building models of uh, water ice stability and hydroxylation. And when Tony was talking about this, well, I raised my hand and said, well, gosh, one other environment you need to consider here is the electrical environment from being, in, being immersed in the uh, solar wind and magnetospheric plasma. Uh, it's really, a, you're surrounded in this conductive medium. Uh, however, when you get into these polar craters, uh, that medium, you start to, uh, uh, the density of that plasma, the flux of that plasma starts to decrease, and in some sense, you start to become less connected to that, to that medium. So if you were going to draw an equivalent electrical circuit for a rover, it would look something like this. This is a very simplistic diagram, but, but basically, as your rover roves across the surface, it's going to tribocharge. It's, the, the wheels are, mi are interacting, mixing with the, the regolith. The wheels are going to tribocharge, and you have two places where you can discharge. You can either discharge into the ground. Now, of course, the ground is a very poor conductor, and particularly cold regolith is an extremely poor conductor. Carrier and all in 92, uh, they had a nice review paper on that. So you're really more electrically grounded to the plasma, to the medium. And of course, on the day side, you're, there's a lot of plasma. You're in the photoelectric sheath. Dissipation times are on the order of you know, less than a millisecond. So as soon as you charge, you discharge. However, in the lunar night side, in these lunar wake regions, and in, 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 in obstruction, obstructed regions, your plasma densities, your plasma fluxes start to drop out. I mean, they can drop in the lunar night side. They can drop by nearly a factor of 1,000. The lunar prospector told us this passing through the uh, the, the uh, trailing wake, and as a consequence, your plasma dissipation times start getting large in these plasma-starved regions. And, you know, we were talking about 10 to 100 seconds. That's the, kind of the time scale at which humans interact. That's the time scale at which uh, rover, rover wheels rove, you know. Um, so uh, let me describe a little more about this unusual solar wind flow around uh, in obstructed regions in the, uh, in, in up at, near the polar region. What happens is for, for uh, the solar wind up in polar regions along the terminator is horizont nearly horizontally flowing. And it consists of both protons and electrons. Now, it's a collisionless fluid. And once you have an obstruction, that plasma does expand back in, but it doesn't expand back in by regular pressure. It's collisionless. The way it expands back in is through electrical forces. What happens is that the low mass electrons move into the void ahead of the ions and as a consequence establish this ambipolar electric field. This is pretty well known in plasma physics. And then that ambipolar electric field then deflects the ions in. But what happens along that leeward edge is you actually have a, 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 a sort of a bite out or a lack of, a, of ion, uh, positive ion flow. And you can actually end up with an electron cloud region. And we've simulated this. Mike Zimmerman back in 2012 did a nice particle and cell plasma simulation of plasma flow into a polar crater. Again, we only have miles. We don't have measurements. So this is what we have at this point. Um, but, you know, you can see over down here, you can see the ambipolar electric field uh, down in that uh, left middle panel. Over in this panel, you can see the flux of the electrons, the secondary electrons, and the ions. And the protons are down by about a factor of 100 to 1,000 just on that leeward edge. Now, once the, the plasma has been diverted and the ions get diverted and they actually start hitting the floor, you can start to get the proton flux back up with the electron flux. But there's a region just behind that leeward edge 
where you uh, have a, 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 a real dropout in the electron or the, ion, the proton influx. We've also uh, solved this problem analytically. Uh, looks something like this. This is actually what we'll, we used in this in this model, this analytical expression. But the bottom line is the the uh, the ion inflow is a function of the distance downstream and the depth. It's really delta z over delta x is the scaling parameter here. So we've uh, used this uh, analytical expression to model the ion inflow into Shoemaker Crater. Again, it's a model. Uh, again, strongly depends on uh, delta z over delta x, the, the, uh, the uh, delta x being the downstream distance from an obstruction and delta z, the, the, uh, the distance into the, into the crater. Let me just go back for a second. And you can again see along that leeward edge a real dropout in the ion concentration. Now, of course, the other thing that's happening is as this rover wheel is, is, is going along, not only is it immersed in the plasma, but it's actually charging up by the triboelectric or contact electrification processes. We're familiar with this. This is when cat fur and rubber, you know, when you rub the two of them, they get charged up. And I'll show you over on the left there is the triboelectric series. When objects up at the top of the series come in contact with objects in the bottom of the series, the ones in the bottom tend to charge negative and the ones on the top tend to charge positive. And, and Desh and Cuzzy wrote down a nice little analytical ex expression for the charge exchange for this. And this will be sort of our, our model for the wheel tribocharging. So what we did is we built this uh, rover wheel electrostatic model. We, we uh, built a hypothetical crater up near the poles. We could change the size and the slope. We allowed the solar wind to, to pass over and expand into the crater using the analytical formulisms that we had before. We applied a tribocharging model where we could vary the triboelectric potential. And again, we, had, we have codes for this, so we sort of merged the codes together. It sort of looks something like this. And so really, you're solving this. In, this is a simplistic form uh, of this uh, charging equation for the wheel where you have a tribocharging current, if you will, on the wheel that's offset by the... Uh, by the ion inflow that would try to dissipate that charge buildup, right? Now, as it turns out, um, you can actually express the tribocharging uh, uh, current to the wheel as a function of the wheel velocity, and th you can actually end up with a little handy-dandy little expression here for the velocity of the wheel where you, would, where you would break charge equilibrium. So in other words, if you go faster than that speed limit, your rover wheel will start to, to charge in excess. Uh, DQ, DT will actually be less than zero and start, start getting a, 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 a charging state for the wheel. If you go less than that speed limit, the ion currents can, can, can dissipate the tribocharge buildup in, in cadence. You'll, you'll maintain equilibrium. So let's try this for a case here. We have an 11 degree crater with 80, me 80 meters to the floor. Again, the solar wind is passing over in this way from left to right. You have the leeward edge. And, and you know, the model, you can calculate surface potentials. You can see the ion current drops out. Actually, whoops, let me just go back here. The ions actually have a hard time hitting that, that leeward wall there. And, uh, and so the ion current drops out by quite a bit. You can calculate the speed limit. I've calculated for two triboelectric potential differences. Whoops, I seem to be... All right, and, 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 and you can see that you're talking about uh, speed limits on that leeward edge of about a, a centimeter a second on that leeward edge. But of course, if you're at the far edge, you know, you're, you, you can go up, up, up at a meter per second and, it, you know, you're, you're not, the, the wheel's not going to charge up because there's, there's plenty of ions. The ion current to the wheel is, is, is large enough to offset the tribal charge buildup. So let's try a little uh, steeper crater, a little deeper. Again, a large uh, negative surface potentials. Uh, ion currents really drop out near that leeward edge, and now you're talking about uh, really, really slow speeds on that leeward edge. Now, of course, if you're on the far edge where the ion flow is direct, again, you're up at a meter per second. So, so our take-home message here, and again, this is more like an engineering study, rovers should really try to enter the crater on the far or windward edge, driving into the sun and the solar wind, because that's where you get good ion flow. That's where you stay, in some sense, electrically grounded to the plasma. If you're on that leeward edge, the, elect, the ion, there are, there, you, you get a loss of the ion influx, um, and uh, in which case you have to move slower to stay in equilibrium. I've talked to Tony about this. In the future, we're hoping that to 
for these kinds of rovers, you place an electrometer near the rover wheel, wheel tire. It's a really cheap and inexpensive way to kind of keep track of this as an ESD hazard. And again, following up with what Jack says, this is not a showstopper by any means, but you know, there's electric good, uh, good uh, sound engineering practices can be employ employed here. Again, one possible remedy, and, and Tony, you talked about this, you row fast, charge up, sort of live with the charge, but then stop for an extended period and let the charge dissipate. And he said that that was one approach. A partial remedy is make sure that grounded wheel, you make sure to ground the wheel uh, to, to the rover body, and then make sure the rover body itself has a large metallic current collecting area. And what you've done now is you increase the return currents to offset the uh, charge buildup. And of course, a full remedy might be something like they do on uh, scientific spacecraft when they want to maintain potentials. You have an electron uh, discharge system to, to have things come in balance. Or you could even actually have a UV lamp to, uh, uh, that, that, can, to, uh, that can be an electron emitter if it shines on a metal surface. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the, the story here. It's a tactical study, kind of an engineering study. But if you're going into the craters, gosh, put on an electrometer. You know, it'd be awesome. All right, thanks. We have, we have time for a few questions. Did you uh, assume that your grain charge was negative or positive? Uh, yeah, we assumed in this case that, the, uh, that it was a, a, a metal wheel, uh, silica-like grain, so the wheel charge negative and the grain charge positive on the triboelectric contact. They do because they're out in the play no. We did not take that into account. The triboelectric charging dominates over the uh, over the uh, the the, the uh, chemical charging in in that case. The, the contact. Grains. What's that? Off a lot of grains. Off a lot of grains. That's right. And that's that. Well, and it's but the same thing with the triboelectric effect too. You actually have a have a lot of grains crunching onto the the rover tire. Is is um, is this something that you could take a useful measurement? With a small payload, as part of like the 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 clips, with a small static lander, could you could you do something useful with a small instrument that would help validate your model? Yes, yep, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, any if there's well for a landed mission, no, it has to be dynamic in this case because that's the tribo charging. Oh, you could actually just look at the plasma, the charging relative to the plasma, and you know, I'm sure there are plasma. Packages being proposed to do that, but in this case, it's the dynamics. It's the fact that you're, ro you're tribo charging, and so you need a rover. And I'm not sure if, if you know a land stationary lander alone um, wouldn't wouldn't solve the full problem. It would tell you about the ion current, though. Yeah. This this is very uh, very interesting. The only electrical discharge that we recorded, that I'm aware of, was in the cameras at the sprockets. Oh, really? And they figured out a way to, to eliminate that. But the early Hasselblad cameras had little uh, lightning <laughs> bolts at the sprockets. Uh, huh. I don't know what that means, but uh, there was a, a lot of electrical... Uh, uh, equipment on the rovers, yeah, and I don't know whether in the uh, recordings of that information coming back, if they picked up any static that from is the rover. Huh. Just I'm talking about how do you test some of these right, right. these hypotheses, right? So it's just something to think about. I I I, I well, guess maybe, you can find some of those those uh, tapes somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> I hope. Of the, of the communications from the rover, because we were communicating a high gain through a high gain antenna and through a low gain antenna, right? Uh, in various at various times. Yeah. But again, the only uh, discharges that I'm aware of were in the, or a couple early missions, probably a 11 and 12, and then somebody figured out how to discharge the, those cameras so that that. Uh, those lightning sprockets, uh, the later film did not show the sprockets. It's interesting. It makes me wonder how they were grounded, those cameras. They had to be, they had been doing Somewhere something. Somewhere that information exists. Yeah. It may be in some of the mission reports, yeah. anomaly reports, uh, huh. that uh, I think are all available now. So. Huh. 
and, and was it, so everything else was charging probably relative to the camera. But I, I don't know. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but I'm not aware that we ever noticed any uh, static uh, in our communications that wasn't related to, say, a, a missed handover of an antenna on Earth or, right. or uh, something like that. There, every once in a while there was static. Uh, but uh, I think it had to do more with uh, large-scale issues than anything like this. Yeah, more, more in the comp. This is very interesting. Yeah. Well, see, on the day side, though, you actually are so immersed that you're dissipating. You, you, you're, you quickly dissipate because you, you you're right at the plant. But in these... Uh, well, but I'm, try I'm trying to think of ways to test right, the right. model. Yeah. Yeah. Even at that very short interval. Yeah, the camera, that's interesting. Okay. Huh. Good. Yeah, thanks. Yep, you bet. All right. Let's think through one more time. He always needs another round of applause.